This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turf Talk. Well, all I've got to say is that we're back. All right? We are back in the Final Four uh, as well as the women. Nobody's surprised. This is Maryland lacrosse. We rule the roost. We are in charge. And uh, is that Bill on the phone? All right. And uh, to discuss the upcoming Final Fours and the path that the Maryland men took to get there uh, is my good buddy, I think, with the Capital Gazette. I'm not sure. I, I, I heard that. Well, uh, and the Baltimore Sun now. They, they bought us. So I work for both the Capital Gazette. And the Baltimore Sun now, Bruce. All right, and the Baltimore Sun. And that, of course, is Bill Wagner. We read him all the time. Bill, you nobody in the world, press-wise, has been to more games at the Naval Academy than you. Would you say that's a fair <laughs> – is that a fair statement? I think that'd be true. I've been covering Navy athletics for almost 20 years now, across all sports across the board. So I would have to say, I mean, obviously, my predecessor, Joe Gross, the legendary Joe Gross, probably has me beat because he did – Maybe for a long time as well, but I'm, I'm catching up to him. I'm not so sure, but I've got to ask you a question. How can half of the stadium be 100% filled and the announced attendance was only 13,000? I was a little surprised by that as well. Uh, you know, the capacity of Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium is in the range of 34,000. So you slice that in half, you got to figure that's 15,000 per side. Now, they do have seating in the one bowl area uh, on, the, right. on the hill, and, but I, that's rather negligible. That's only like two or 3,000. So, yeah, I thought there was more than that there on Sunday. It was a heck of a crowd, I'll say that. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And you know what? It galls me. And I, talk, I talked to Connor Kelly yesterday. I talked to Coach Tillman. And I haven't talked to one person who doesn't think that the Naval Academy should be the home of the Final Four. Because the— well, I, I, I think it'd be an excellent choice, and if you, and I think it would be more um, size appropriate. Uh, I think you go to the Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium, and you do pack that place, and it's an incredible atmosphere. And the stadium is all you want. It's it's in great shape. They have all the facilities necessary. Um, I I think it should go back to a college venue, whether it's Navy or somewhere else. But uh, I think that the crowds that the Final Four is attracting is more appropriate to a collegiate stadium than these massive pro stadiums. Well, you know, this weekend up in Boston, you'll get probably 30,000 on Saturday and probably 22 on Sunday, and it seems like it's empty. You know, it, right. just, it seems like it's empty. You know, it's like, you know, you think to yourself, and then you deal with the fact that the games are kind of split with attendance because, say, the Maryland Duke fans might not go in early for the first game. And it's like, it's never a big crowd. And right. to me, it makes no sense. But let's get down to the facts here. How impressed with you were you with how the rest of the team kind of took over for Connor Kelly as we talk about the Terps on Saturday, especially Bubba Fairman with five points? Very impressed. And they showed tremendous balance across the board. But, you know, we have seen that throughout the season. You know, Jared Bernhardt is very capable. Um, you know, they have other weapons. Connor Kelly has been a consistent force. But I liked what Coach Tillman said in the post-game press conference is that, you know, he was talking to Connor Kelly during the game, and Connor said, I I don't feel like I really got to press this. I mean, everybody's – we're moving the ball. Everybody's getting open looks. You know, if if Maryland had only had four or five goals going into the fourth quarter, then maybe you ask your star to try to start taking over. But there was no need for him to try to to press things and – you know, so your credit to Cornell for holding him down. But, yeah, the other fellow stepped up. You know, it's funny because I asked him about that yesterday. And he said, you know, we're winning 12 to, four, 12 to 4 after 3 or 11 to 4. He said, I was afraid to get involved. I mean, because right? they, they really, he <laughs> took away, was his, I think, Jake Culver, their best long pole. And Jake Culver could not help anybody else. And I, you know, right. and I think this thing about face guarding, and now they did it to Teat, and it worked. But face guarding doesn't always work if you're surrounded by great players. And I obviously, agree 100%. Right. And um, obviously, I, 
I don't know if, the, you know, if uh, Albany's going to face guard Ben Reeves. I really don't. But uh, the way that Yale handled them the first time, I think they might have to do something uh, to counteract that. All right, let's talk about Duke a little bit. Did you get a chance to see Duke play live this year? I oh, Well, obviously I, I did on Sunday, first and foremost, right. when they had played Hopkins and was very impressed. And I saw them one other time on television. The kid, Justin Guterding, is a big-time player and scorer. And uh, this freshman, Montgomery, had really stepped up on Sunday. And he's kind of like a little mini Miles Jones who can, he can you know, dodge left to right and is very talented. Yeah, I know. I agree with that from what I saw. And uh, uh, also their face-off guy, uh, was it Bryn Smith, had a just a fantastic game. 18 for 25. He's a sophomore. He's uh, won about 52% of his face-offs this year. But Maryland always seems to come up with an answer to that. Somehow or another, if it's Shockey, if it's Henningsen, if it's uh, Bones, Bonaparte, they seem to have an answer to that. And I look back on the last two times Maryland and Duke played in the Final Four, and there were two blowouts by Maryland. Now, that's a while ago. But sometimes teams can have somebody's number. I think Duke has Hopkins' number. Duke is, what do they beat him, four times in a row by significant yeah. scores? But uh, yep. how yep. do you feel about the game? What do you see happening? Well, I mean, I like Maryland. I mean, I just I, the way Maryland has played in the postseason under John Tillman is just incredibly impressive, and that's kind of what I wrote about on Sunday. You know, seven and zero in the quarterfinal final round, which really, in a lot of ways, is the nut cutting round because every team is capable. When you're down to eight, every team is capable, and taking that next step into the semifinals is so difficult. And for, for Maryland to be 7-0 and in the quarterfinals under Coach Tillman is just remarkable, in my opinion. And they just have gotten it done. But same can be said for Duke. That is another program that has just been tremendous in the postseason in the NCAA tournament under John Donowski. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Duke may have been 9-0 and in quarterfinals at one point under Donowski. But uh, they have also been a proven uh, a consistent Final Four uh, program, national championship contender. I mean, this is a big-time matchup coming up on Saturday. Well, listen to these scores. This even says more about John Tillman and his preparation. 2011, Terp 6, Syracuse 5 in overtime. If you remember, Catalino had that winner on a really yep. good-designed play. Uh, 2012, Terps 11, Hopkins 5. F- uh, 14, Terp 16, Brian 8. 2015, Terps 14 to 7 over Carolina. 16, 13 to 7 over Cuse. 18 to 9 over Albany last year, and 13 to 8 over Cornell. So not only has Maryland won these quarterfinal games, uh, which is the hardest game, you know. Let's face it, a measure of success is making that Final Four. Correct. I mean, that's absolutely correct. You rarely have ever seen a lacrosse coach fired because he made the Final Four and didn't win the title. All right, but, right. Well, and I hate to say it, our good friend Dave Cottle, that's kind of what did him in at Maryland is that he there they lost a lot in the quarterfinal round. Yeah, they uh, they lost. They, a, they made the semis a few times, but there was too many quarterfinal losses, and it was a a quarterfinal upset. It was the year that he kind of got pushed out by Debbie Yao, but. You know, yeah, the quarterfinal is a really tough hurdle to clear. And you're right. Uh, I think the stat was that Maryland, you take out that one overtime game against Syracuse, and it's something like an average of eight goals per game they've won these quarterfinals. Yeah, that's that's insane. But credit to Donowski. He's 9-1 and one in the quarterfinals. I mean, yes. I mean, that's very serious record. And there's two, right. there's two national championships in there. And I don't think he lost the final. So he's only been in the, in the national game twice. Maryland's been there five times. And Maryland's one and four, of course. But uh, there's a lot of talent on Duke, all right? Uh, a ton of talent. Uh, their yeah, goal- this Guterding guy has 104 points, Bruce. 61 goals and 43 assists. <laughs> That's right, you're, a heck of a season. You're Coach Tillman. you got Guterding and you've got uh, Montgomery. Does Guter, does Bryce Young draw Guterding, in your opinion, and maybe uh, Curtis Corley get 
uh, Montgomery, or is Montgomery just kind of like had a good game, but he's not really a dominant guy? No, he's he's a guy that's come on strong toward the end of the year. He's a young kid, um, very very athletic, very talented. Um, really, you know, showed some things in that in that quarterfinal on Sunday. But uh, you no, know, Guterding, Bryce, they'll put the best player, best defender on Guterding. They've got a couple other high scores here: Brad Smith, sixty-one points; Joe Robertson, fifty-four points. Actually, Montgomery is only like eighth in scoring for them. Um, but he's he's a guy that, if, you know, that teams are starting to put a pole on him as a midfielder. You have to decide which midfielder to put a long pole on. And some teams are starting to have to put a pole on Montgomery because he's one of these guys that can dodge you and go right past you, and then you're sliding. And that's what you're trying to avoid is have a guy that's breaking down your defense. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Duke's got their share of uh, good shorties, and that's probably been one of Maryland's weaknesses this year. But Maryland, you know, since the questionable games against uh, Johns Hopkins uh, has kind of rebounded. They had that little lull in their season. To me, they've come back. And believe me, I watched every second Maryland played this year. And I, you heard Tillman kind of agree with me that it was a kind of a letdown there toward the end. I mean, they really were challenged by a vastly underrated Robert Morris team. And... You know, sometimes you have to give credit to the opponent. You know, they had the, they had the tarps on the ropes for a while. But Maryland, I, I think with their depth and everything, was ready to come through it. All right. right. Well, it's just gotten, it's starting to show you what else is out. The way that college lacrosse on, on the men's side is gone, there's just not enough programs to, 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 for all the good players. And it, that's why a school like – I mean, you, Robert Morris had some legitimate players. I thought they had three or four guys that looked to me like they could have played anywhere, and that's what's happening. A lot of really good players are falling to what you know we consider mid majors, and and these teams are capable uh, when it comes into the first round of the NCAA tournament. And Coach Tillman was mentioning that they've had their hands full with a couple of underdogs over the years. Yeah, I looked at Duke's losses this year. They lost to Penn ten to nine, not really impressive. They lost to Syracuse, which to me. Syracuse was so overrated that it was scary. What did they wind up eight and seven? You know, they even, they barely belonged in the tournament. And then right, they, Navy Navy beat Syracuse at at the Carrier Dome. Well, Navy was a good team, but my point is is that Syracuse had seven losses. You know, seven yeah. losses, and they lost every game almost out of conference that had any meaning to it. I mean, you right. just you you know how do you get in on your on your history? But their history hasn't been that great lately. And uh, believe me, I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't really fearful of Cornell because they were so reliant on that one guy who Jeff Teat, who is fantastic. But it seems like when you shut him down, that was it. But right, uh, well, that's why you don't see a lot of teams go to the shutdown because of just what you were saying. You know, you don't want to play shut off too much on Maryland with uh, um, Connor Kelly because they got so many other weapons. You know, they'll, they'll just play you five on five. The, the deal with Cornell is that teams just thought that Teat was just everything. He was the playmaker for them. And if you took him out of their offense, there wasn't as much firepower. You know, you're talking about the losses. I uh, also remember Duke lost to Notre Dame in the uh, semifinals of the ACC tournament. Correct. And uh, Notre Dame, I didn't think it was all that great this year. Yeah, Notre Dame, uh, you know, certainly their performance against Denver in the uh, tournament was not impressive. But, uh, look, Andy Shea's a great coach for Yale, and and Scotty Marr, everybody loves him. He's a great guy, and, you know, it'll be hard to root against him, except if he's playing Maryland, it won't be hard at all. But uh, Albany is great. They beat Maryland, although they were down 8-3 to three with a minute to go in the third quarter. Uh, I don't think that would happen again. Uh, I really, really don't. We don't know how banged up Connor Kelly still is. Connor uh, Fields. Fields, right? Yeah, and uh, he played in the he played in the quarterfinals, but didn't really do a whole lot. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. Last year, if you remember, the other teams put such an emphasis on stopping Rambo and Hecock that uh, it was Connor Kelly and Timmy Rotance, Adam DeMillo, and Dylan Maltz who took Maryland to the title, and you know that's why they call it a team. You know, yep. you got to be spread out. You got to have it all. And when all is said and done, there's some good goaltenders in this game. But 
for pressure, for history and everything, I'll take Danny Morris. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I think the one team that really would have given Maryland trouble was Hopkins. Hopkins, Petromala right. coached his butt off against Maryland and really uh, both times, maybe the first game, you know, Maryland won. They were a little lucky down by seven to five with two minutes left or three minutes left. And then the championship game was uh, dominated by Hopkins. But who do you like? Let's get down to facts in the Yale-Albany game, uh, Bill. That is a tough one because Yale has probably been the most consistent team all year. I mean, they had one slip-up in the Ivy League championship. They lost to Cornell. That is a very good offensive team. You mentioned Ben Rees. They've also got Jackson Morrill, who's, I remember his father, Mike Morrow, was a great player at Johns Hopkins back in the day. He comes from an incredible line of lacrosse players. His dad, his grandfather, Kelso, is in the Lacrosse Hall of Fame. And Mike Morrow, his dad, is in the Lacrosse Hall of Fame as well. So that kid's a heck of a player, Jackson Morrow. Wait till you see him on Saturday. Uh, they're loaded, and they are talented. They are, and they have steamrolled a few teams. They've, they've had games where they scored 22, 23 goals. Um, they, you know, they're, they, people say the goalie is a little bit suspect, but he played quite well in the quarterfinal victory over Loyola. Uh, so, you know, they held Loyola a low number, so Yale's defense stood up in that game. Uh, I don't know which way to go with that because Albany is also uh, very – put it this way, that's going to be a high-scoring game. On paper, that shapes up as a 16-14 type of game because I think both teams like to push the ball and, and score some goals and – You've, you've heard about this kid at Albany, the nanny coke kid, the freshman uh, from the Onondaga Nation. He's something else. Uh, and, you know, you were talking about Scott Marr, the connection at Maryland. You know, he was an assistant of course. under Dick Adell for a long time and absolutely reveres Dick Adell. They're, they are just so – they were so close. And so it kind of would be interesting in, in the year that we're honoring and remembering our great friend Dick Adell, if Maryland played Albany – uh, you'd be talking about two coaches that have a lot of respect for Dick Adele. Obviously, Maryland has dedicated the remainder of this season and is wearing that great shirt in honor of Dick, uh, the big man, every time in, in, the, in the games as their uh, warm-ups and the coaches are wearing it. So that would be kind of an interesting uh, final, Albany-Maryland, with the Dick Adele connection. Yeah, I, I like Yale in that game just because they beat them 14-6. to 6. That tells me that they, there's something there that they're able to handle, and I think it's defensively. Uh, and also probably a little bit on, the, you know, they certainly can match T.D. Earl and, uh, with this guy, uh, Connor Mackey, and their, short, their shorty is phenomenal, Kyle Warner. So yeah, uh, we'll see how it goes, but there is no upset in these games in either game, whichever way it goes. Oh yeah, I would not surprise to see it, it, whoever advances. It will not be a surprise to me. All four of these teams are capable. I mean, there, it's not uh, for all four of these teams. Uh, you nobody's surprised to see any of them at the, at this level now. No, there there are no upsets this weekend. And now we go real quick. We only got a few minutes to the women's. Kathy Reese once again struggled this time against a tremendous Navy team with uh, the Collins kid who was just fantastic. Down fourteen to eleven. I thought they were in trouble, Bill. I thought they were. Yeah. I thought they were in big trouble. I thought I, thought I was about to watch one of the biggest upsets in lacrosse history and. Navy did it the year before. The last, last uh, 2017, they went down to North Carolina and upset the defending national champion, North Carolina. So it, it's, it's not like Navy hadn't done it before. They did the exact same thing the year before. But you're, you're right. I, I was watching that. I was there at the game field level right there, uh, and it was intense. What a great game that was. I'll tell you what, one thing I've told a lot of people, I, I watched that Navy-Maryland game on Saturday, and the next day I went to the men's games, and – I hate to say it, but watching the men's games is like watching paint dry at times compared to the women. Those women go up and down the field, a lot of scoring, a lot of action. And uh, sometimes these men's games, they slow it down, and it's substitutions and long possessions. And I don't know. I, I tell you what, the women's game's exciting, Bruce. Yeah, yeah I, think that, I think Maryland might have been in trouble without the 60-second clock in that game. Because uh, yeah. th these teams can hold the ball forever. I've seen it happen where you just can't get the ball. Yeah, the only way you got to start fouling, and it just doesn't work. I mean, I saw Northwestern win two titles by just holding the ball. But yeah, uh, yeah well, that's why they put the rule in and to get rid of that because people are all saying this has got to stop. Yeah, 
Megan Whittle took over, Bill. I mean, Megan Whittle said, we're not going to lose this game. I'm going to see to it. And she did. She took over the game, and it was a great win for Maryland. And again, Maryland-Boston College is going to be a great game. And on the other side of the bracket, we got Carolina and Madison, is it? Yep, James Madison right. making the pair. They've really come on as a program in recent years. Very, very good uh, team. They had... They were a seeded team, so it's no surprise they're they're here. Well, that should be interesting. But uh, Bill, I can't. You know, wait. the other Meg that took over that game on Saturday was Meg Taylor, the goalie. She oh. was incredible. She made some saves that were just jaw dropping, Bruce. Yeah, no, there's no doubt she made a lot of them when the game was on the line. And yes. uh, without her, you know, look, her and Danny Morris. It's a funny comparison. Both times this year when the men's and women's teams were in somewhat of trouble, it was our goalies, who, as it often happens, who bailed them out. And I thought yep. Megan Taylor bailed them out because they had no answer for that Collins kid. She was Right. I mean, there were some saves in that down the stretch in the second half that were just unbelievable. She is so quick. I mean, I thought Navy had her dead to rights. It was one-on-one, point blank. And how she stopped those shots, I don't know. But she's something else. Bill, we're out of time. We've got to head to break, as always. Thank you so much right. for coming on. Uh, I can't wait for this weekend. It's going to be something special. Always good to talk to you, Bruce. Love talking Terps with you. All right, my friend. Take care. All right, okay. with that, we'll head out to our first break. This is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford Terp Talk. And, this, and also the Sports Maven, because this show will be replayed on Saturday. And so this segment was brought to you by Coons Ford, and we're going to have Dennis Kalatsis on in a few minutes to discuss all the action in football, which took over the news today. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. You know, it's utterly amazing that tonight is such a big night in sports around here you have the seventh game of the capitals trying to make the stanley cup which they just haven't had they just haven't been there since they were in it years ago against the red wings that got swept and then you got game five of the celtics and lebron which certainly stands to be a tremendous game and the nfl as always comes out with certain rulings and it's like they they take the air out of the wind and uh, once again, the anthem controversy is stirred up. I'm not really going to get into it. It's it's so, it's just it's just no matter what they do, they can't seem to come up with the the proper answer. And uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And then they really changed. I think the big news today, along with that, was the uh, kickoff situation. Uh, the kickoff now it's changed to the point of the following ways, which I think is interesting. The elimination of running starts for kickoff coverage teams. There's now a requirement that eight of the 11 men on the return team must be aligned in the setup zone within 15 yards of the ball. No blocking within the setup zone until after the ball touches the ground, if it's not first caught. That's all. I don't know what they're going to just backtrack. It's the elimination of the two-man wedge block, and the kickoff team must have five men lined up on either side of the ball, a move that will limit schemes designed to get free runners in coverage down the field. Now, they also said that concussions dropped last year, but the league is trying to slow down the return and the attack, all right, to stop as much injury as they can. And here's the bottom line. If the numbers don't approve to the league's liking, more dramatic changes, including the elimination of kickoffs, would be on the table for 2019. Now, as for me, I could do without the kickoff. To see guys' careers ruined over kickoffs that now nine times out of ten are kicked out of the end zone, certainly in the first half of the season, I'll say seven times out of ten. It's become a very, very meaningless play, and I think that's the eventual goal. we we'll switch over to Maryland basketball right now, and the news is not great. 
This is from Sports Illustrated. Kevin Herter is now projected as the 18th pick to the Spurs. This is from Jerry, Jeremy Wu from Sports Illustrated, and this was after the combine. This is what he had to say. Perhaps the biggest winner at the draft combine, while playing through an injured finger on a shooting hand, Kevin Herter put on a display in drills, may jumpers, and slick passes in the scrimmage, then shut it down on day two. While the word coming into the week was that he was heavily considering returning to Maryland, the quality of his showing seems to have forced the issue. Herter was a good bet for the first round next year, but now that timetable has accelerated. His size, shooting stroke, and ability to make difficult shots off the catch and dribble are all high-level traits for a two-guard. And he tested well athletically, which didn't hurt. His ability to make quick decisions, and space the floor would fit nicely in San Antonio. And if he gets a shot to be the 18th pick and he gets a shot to play for Coach Popovich, it's a no-brainer. He's gone. And if that's the case, he's just, you know, you can't blame him in the least. If he moves up that high, which is just below a lottery pick, uh, the money, the slotted money is very serious. And as a two guard, uh, we believe that, or I certainly believe he'd be tremendously successful. Projected Bruno Fernando as the 34th pick. That's the 14th pick in the second, uh, the fourth pick in the second round. And what does that leave him? That leaves him probably in the D League. All right, you agree, Greg? My producer, Greg, is shaking his hand. Bruno should come back. I don't think he's ready. A guy who's ready for the NBA has great games, game in and game out. And he did not have that for Maryland. Justin Jackson, who already hired an agent, is uh, slotted as the 56th pick in the NBA draft by the same Jeremy Wu. And this is all based on numbers after, okay, after the combine. So, look, it is what it is. So it doesn't look like Herter's coming back. And I also heard he interviewed fantastically. And uh, it looks like there's a chance that Bruno Fernando comes back, although he doesn't come from wealthy uh, roots. And that usually means if they float around that half a million a year or even a little bit more, I got a feel he's not going to be back. But you got to take it as it is. And a long time ago, I got tired of getting upset about these guys leaving. It's their right. That's why they come to college. Uh, you know, look, some of them, they come also for an education, but that's not the goal of these guys who are in NBA quality or NBA eligible. Their, uh, their goal is to try and get in the draft and try and make the bigs. And uh, Herter though he would have been a first-round pick next year, uh, is just speeding up. And maybe Herter would be a top-five pick next year. Who knows? But then again, you don't know what could happen. You don't know injury or whatever, and it's all about the, it's all about the cash. It's all about the money. So uh, right now, it doesn't look great for Herter. He still is the kind of kid who could change his mind and want to come back like Miles Bridges did. Miles Bridges is slotted to be the 10th pick in the draft. That's lottery. That's probably at least, what, a million and a half a year for him, maybe more. And uh, I guess we'll see how it goes. But right now, Kevin Herter projected as the 18th pick to the San Antonio Spurs. No one, and I mean no one, could ever fault him for taking that offer. Uh, of course, it's going to probably really sting Mark Turgeon, who just has not been able to like keep. Uh, it's amazing, Maryland didn't make the uh, the NCAA tournament, yet you could have three kids from the team in the NBA draft. It almost seems impossible, but it's not, and it's a shame because had those kids come back next year along with what's coming, because Turgeon really has great kids coming, and that's why you don't get upset about it. It's just, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do, and you just, you know, get over it and accept it and move on, and I'm tired of, like, getting upset about it because... When you get upset about what an 18 or 19 year old decides to do with his life and you're 60 in your 60s, 
forget about it. It just isn't worth worrying about. Just move on, and Turge will make it happen with what we got. All right, with that, we're going to head out to break number two. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk. And on Saturday, Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. We'll be back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Back here on segment three as we begin our countdown to uh, the national championship game. If you're listening on Saturday, we're about, uh, let me see, 9, 10, about four and a half hours away. And uh, I'm going to bring in my good buddy who's lived and died with me with for, with Maryland lacrosse for the past couple of years, a guy I converted to a lacrosse fan, and that, of course, is Wayne Viner. Wayne, welcome in this evening. Hey, it's great to be here. It is a uh the playoff atmosphere, no matter what you're following, this is a true playoff atmosphere. I don't know if you got a chance to talk about it, Bruce, but you were on campus yesterday, and those videos are up on Turp Talk, and you actually got a chance to talk to somebody that's been a very popular video for us, and that is freshman superstar Bubba Fairman. How did he how'd that feel up close and personal? Bubba is just, he's, uh, look, when we first met him at uh, the Under Armour Games, uh, when was that, in July? You and me came away. I believe away, so. Yeah, you and me came away with the feeling, hey, this kid's got it. I mean, he reminded us both right away of Colin Heacock with that brashness and the confidence. And if he didn't prove that on Sunday, when Connor Kelly was being shadowed by Jay Culver and two other people, uh, Bubba Fairman and and Jared Bernhardt really stepped up with a one-two punch and throwing Logan Logan Wisnowskis and uh, some assorted other guys. And you know, Wayne, you heard of this all along. Well, Cornell and Jeff Teat, they're going to be tough to beat for Maryland. Maryland hadn't faced anybody like them. And then the score was, you know, 4-1, four 4-2, to 6-4. Four to two, six to four. And then the uh, third period started in 7-4, to 8-4, 9-4, 10-4. way we kind of looked at each other and said, who were we ever to think that Maryland wouldn't come through in this game for the seventh time in a row? Give me a break. Well, that seven times in a row is a big deal. Now, I know that uh, I think it was nice that Mike Preston came over and said hi in the press box. Uh, did you want to talk about that for a second? About yeah, I talked about it last Kobe? week that, you know, he kind of like Mike, who I respect as much as any sports columnist I've ever known, kind of talked about that. Uh, Bill Tierney and Donowski usually are the guys who find a way to win. And I said, how could you mention those two names without mentioning Coach Tillman? You know, and then we talked about that for a while. And Tierney went down, much to my delight. And uh, and Donowski's there. You got to give him credit. Now, he's 9 out of 10 in the quarterfinal games. 0-2 against Maryland in the semis in the Final Four. It will be a great game. Terps have to take on uh, Justin Guterding, but if anybody thinks that they're hesitant or scared of playing them, I, I really don't know them that well because Maryland right now, I got the feeling yesterday, Wayne, and I relayed this to you, and you can look, if you watch the tapes and you watch Connor Kelly talk and you watch uh, Bubba Fairman talk and uh, Danny Mars talk, there is a confidence about this team that I think was really came back after the comeback against Robert Morris. And uh, I think that that could show through all the way to the end. And that's taken nothing away from the opponents. Uh, Duke went over Maryland would certainly not be the most major upset that there's ever been in lacrosse. It would barely be an upset. And Yale and uh, Albany are two great teams. But I just have that feeling. I haven't had it all year. I got it now. And uh, we'll see what happens on Sunday. Going into well, the, you were pretty uh, conf- uh, you were pretty confident about Maryland winning against Cornell. There was very little doubt well, yeah. in your mind. You know what, it, since Maryland has a really good program, and my take on this all season, 
once we had some evidence, is maybe this isn't the greatest Maryland team that's ever played. And, and you, we've talked on and off the air. Maybe it's the team that lost to Carolina in overtime. was overall maybe the best team they've had. Uh, last year was pretty darn good. But this might not quite be that team, but it's the best team in college lacrosse. And week after week, Maryland's proved it's the best team in college lacrosse. They haven't had any major injuries. Some of the guys they brought in that took some time to develop, like Justin Shockey at the faceoff, and boy, he was dominant, wasn't he, Bruce? Yeah, and uh, of course, Logan Wisnowskis has been a tremendous surprise. Not that he was good, that... You know, he would fit in and score more than 30 goals as a freshman. I was talking with uh, Connor Kelly about it. It's on the tape that uh, Logan and Bubba Fairman had better years than Connor Kelly did as a freshman and Matt Rambo and Colin Heacock. You know? Okay, so I got I to gotta bring up something. I took a picture, and the, the photos are up in the, our postgame show on TurpTalk.com. And there's a photo of Connor Kelly with the one jersey. Fairman with the two, and Wisnowskis with his 12. And I remember when when Dylan Maltz, Rambo, and Heacock walked off last year at the end. You said you wanted that picture because I had a picture of those three walking off. But I look at this and go, well, those were three of the greatest players Merrill ever had. And now you look at these, and two of them are freshmen. And, and somehow John Tillman has remade this team into a championship team. And to add to that, he promoted a couple kids up from the scout team. Uh, one is Snyder and the other is Anthony DeMeo, both of whom scored huge goals this year. Bruce, how does Tillman keep reloading and, and build off the scout team? Can you talk about that a little uh, bit? I, it's incredible, but Maryland takes its scout team more serious than any team I've ever heard. There is not a press conference that goes by, win or lose, where they don't compliment the scout team, where they don't say how crucial the scout team is. And I've had several players tell me that they believe the scout team could beat many of the teams that Maryland plays. That's what they think of them. And for these kids to be dedicated like that is incredible. And if you come to Maryland, with the rare exceptions of a Bubba Fairman or Justin Shockey or uh, Logan Wisnowskis, but Wayne, we have to remember, Bubba Fairman took an extra year, a prep year. Logan Wisnowskis had a warm-up year at Syracuse. They are in their first year of eligibility, but they're not really freshmen. And and you have to think about that. That uh, look, Tillman with Wisnowskis and Shockey got two guys who immediately helped this team turn. And I think it's because of the fact that Maryland is the desirable place to go to. You want to get to the Final Four, you want to get to Championship Weekend, then get on that team somehow and ride the pony, and if you play your heart out, you'll get a chance eventually. And that's what I I think that's the mindset that works, Wayne. All right. So with all that, we've both been in the Maryland team house for lacrosse. And I know he gets, tell me get some of the best recruits in the nation anyhow. They're going to move in where football has been. They're probably going to move next year. So on top of having a, a Final Four run, you said 7-0, and getting to the Final Four. And over the eight years he's been here, this is the seventh Final Four. They're going to have a new building on top of that. And that only can help recruiting. But I can't let this go too long. I don't want to run out of time here. Tell me about what you saw with Hopkins and Duke, because I was all on, all in for Hopkins. I thought it was going to be Maryland Hopkins at 2.30 Saturday, and it's not. It's Maryland Duke. What happened to Hop? To me, Hopkins has, it's a matchup problem with Duke. They've had it. They've lost the last three times they played him. It wasn't close. To me, Hopkins was playing almost as good as anybody there is in the country at that point. And believe me, uh, it would have been great to see a third Maryland Hopkins game, but it could have turned out to be more problematic than a Maryland Duke game. Now, we don't know that yet. We don't know how Maryland's going to play Duke. I mean, we don't know, but that's just a gut feeling that I've had, and I think you had it too, of watching the two Maryland Hopkins game, that uh, in this particular season, 
Petromala did a great job of figuring out Maryland and what he had to do. And I think that Hopkins, they just lit up when they saw uh, the red on the other side of the field in Maryland. But they did not match up well with Duke. They lost the faceoffs. And that was, of course, always a key factor. And yeah. when you get, I think uh, Moreland was only uh, 7 for 25. So when you go 18 to 25 and you've got a kid like uh, Justin Guterding, the, the largest scorer in the history of lacrosse, uh, it's going to be problematic for you. And, you know, if, if Hopkins controls the faceoffs like that, Maryland's going to have a tough time. It doesn't seem to happen against Maryland. Somehow or another, no. Tillman comes up with some combination that works. Whether it's Shockey and then Henningsen or just Shockey or Bones or he even drops in a Curtis Corley once in a while, it just works. The question is, can, can they stop? Here's a question I'll put to Bill Wagner. I'll put it to you. Knowing Maryland and Bryce Young and Curtis Corley, and Jack Welding, who does Maryland put on Guterding? That's a hell of a question. They're, they're going to put all of them on. We saw it for a while. You said Thomas O'Connell was the MVP of the game for Maryland because he had uh, Teeth one-on-one for a while. And then they rotated. It was Corley, then it was Young, but Jack Welding got most of the minutes being number one defenseman. I think if it worked this week, I think you do it again. You let Welding do that. Let the other two guys be the enforcers on the back line and let Jack Welding chase them all over the offensive zone. He will shut them down. Uh, it seems that way, but uh, Reeves is a, a bigger guy. You're not going to be able to manhandle him. And uh, I think we might see me that if Maryland's lucky enough to get to the finals and the opponent is Albany, you might see right. Jack Welding against Connor Fields. Okay. So you we know. got about two minutes left here on the big clock. Do you have a preference, Yale or Albany? No, I, I think both teams are fantastic. Albany beat Maryland. Yale we haven't seen. You know, to me, I'd rather play the team that I've seen. All right, because the preparation that short amount of time is is much less, and I think that Tillman is the king of preparation. When he has a week to prepare for anybody, look out. All right, he's going to have forty eight hours, and naturally, Maryland gets the late game. What else is new? So we do. Hey, you got some time with Maryland's all time leading scorer, Megan Whittle. So just for, for all the Todd Carton fans out there. What was your impression of her, and do you think Maryland's going to roll to a championship in the women's side? Well, I don't know why not. Megan Whittle took that team into her hands when they were in trouble, 14-11 against Navy. She took them home, and Megan Whittle was really something special. Great kid, another McDonough kid. And I don't know if you heard the news in Washington. Great news for McDonough High School today. Taylor Cummings has been appointed the new coach of McDonough, and that's what it should be. And Taylor's one of the greatest kids we I've met at College Park, and she is now the head coach of McDonough. And uh, does that help Maryland? Maybe a little bit, but these kids go where they want to go. They don't listen to the coach much. But I'm going to let you hear my final soliloquy. I'm tired, Wayne, of every time Maryland gets in a big game that the other team is going to rise up and take us down. So here comes the Duke Blue Devils, who we had for lunch two times in a row in the semifinals. Here's my bottom line. Maryland will take down Duke. What happens in the next game, I'll tell you after it plays. But Maryland's going to take down Duke. And Danny Morris and Connor Kelly is going to have a good game, a great game. They can't stop him. My bottom line is Maryland probably around 14 and Duke probably around 10. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Let's get it on, Wayne. Here we come, Terps. Okay, I can't top that. Bruce, you have to take us all the way out here. All right, that take is, care, buddy. We're out of time. All right, go Terps. We'll see you on Wednesday at Terp Talk and Saturday on the Sports Maven.